Tonight at the museum, I'm doing something that I haven't done for quite a long time. I'm giving a lecture. I'm actually giving a lecture on the immigration of Italians coming to America. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have the Lower East Side Preservation Association come in and basically uh, organize this event for us and actually have a full house. So it's a great experience right down here on the Library Street. I hope everybody enjoys it. Anybody else? <coughs> yes, sir. Some questions. Um, statement. Many, many years ago, <clears throat> when I was in totally different business, <coughs> we used to come down to uh, the lower east side to find uh, carvers and sculptors. They were always Italian to carve cabinetry and so on. They also had very wonderful skills in addition to a lot of the difficult work. Absolutely. And as I point out, Luigi Del Bianco's work here, he was a major stone carver from Mount Rushmore. But the Picciarilli brothers, who didn't live in Little Italy, but they had this studio in the Bronx, in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, were incredible carvers. They did the pediment in front of the New York Stock Exchange. They did all of the lions and all the sculptures around the New York Public Library. They also did the Lincoln Memorial for Daniel French. They fabricated and shipped it down to Washington, D.C. Constantino Bramini is the architect of the U.S. Capitol. The first one who did the apotheosis of Washington in the rotunda, all the frescoes. Italians are beautiful in this country. I mean, and, and, and they loved America. America was this wonderful experience, this noble experiment, you know, of democracy that they all believed in and wanted to be part of. So, yes, there were, there were Italians that came earlier than the, than the immigrant population from the 1880s, but they, weren't part, they really weren't Italian. They were from these different areas that I described before 18, 1861. The two sides of the Declaration of Independence, William Parker, David Rodney, William Parker became governor of Maryland. David Rodney became governor of Delaware. Um, and we also have Filippo Mazze, who is in Monticello, <coughs> Jefferson's home. He was a botanist, and he wrote a book called Furioso. And it's in the library in, in Monticello. And it was in, written in Italian, Italian of the, of the day. And Jefferson wrote, read Italian. And in that book, he gives Jefferson the words, all men are created equal. Oh, gee. So, you know, Italian, Italian thought has been very much alive in America since its very beginnings. Um, the Italians came here later, the immigrants from the hard work from the South, you know, to, you know, find a better life and to give. And I think they gave, I personally think they gave a lot, they gave an awful lot to this country. They built it, we've built it. We've, and I think also, I remember in 1975, when the city was on terrible shape. You know, we were going bankrupt, and uh, you know, Big Mac bonds. Some of you remember those things. The, and you know, the the really, there were a lot of the Italians who did not take flight. They stayed, and they in the boroughs, not not down here, but in the boroughs, and they stayed, and whereas a lot of people left. So and that was, I think, so they have a tendency of wanting to maintain their areas. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes, sir. Do you have any? Um understanding that you could share about the tendency for Italians to become uh, dock workers, longshoremen? Was there a, Well, I have several in my family as well. Actually, when I did the exhibition at the New York Historical Society, Judge Michael Pesci gave me one of the, well, gave me his father's hook. And I have one, I have another one up here, you know, bailing, bailing hook. Um, it, was another, it was another job that they could get. You know, that was again manual labor. Um, that they would, they, not that they had great expertise in it or knew anything about it before they got, before they did the shape ups. Um, but that's, that's basically the reason for it. It wasn't that they were dock workers in, in, in Italy. Right. And they came here and they just, those were jobs that were available. They were strong guys. They were strong guys and willing to work hard. Um, there, are, there are documents that I've seen um, where the Italians were given less money than any other, any other group. 
uh, including African Americans, weren't called African Americans, <coughs> they were called Negroes on the on the documents. Um, but we're given we're given le we're given day wages less than anybody else mm -hmm. because you know they were the lowest ones on the totem pole, but they were willing to work and work hard. And a lot and people didn't like that because you know they were you know taking they jobs away from them. <laughs> They're willing to work crazy hours and in all kinds of weather and all kinds of conditions. You know, and, and the immigrants do that all the time. I mean, I remember just 10, 15 years ago, you saw a lot of Korean grocers. You don't see too many anymore. Why? They move up. They move up. The kids don't want to do that. They don't want to work. They don't work 14, 15 hours a day. They want to. 18 hours a day, right? They, I mean, that's what the, and that's what the Italian storekeepers were like. Somebody was looking for a picture, and I don't have it. I'm gonna have to ask one of my friends if I can get if he has if he has it of Mario Cuomo's family because they would, they had a little grocery store, and those grocery stores were like banks too. I mean, you, know, you would go there if you didn't have any money, they would keep it on a record or yeah. on a tab, you know, and, and you would you know, you would take things on and they pay them at the end of the week, you know. But those are crazy hours they work. They work seven days a week, you know, and you know. Many, many hours. Yep. It wasn't like it is today. Go to the store, buy something. <coughs> Joe, thank you for this presentation. You covered a lot of areas. I have a couple of questions, and they're all over the place. A couple of uh, in, in order. Do you know much about the Italian Catholic Church right off of Houston? Was that part of this community? Which one? Which, one which church? Uh, it's right south of Houston. St. Anthony, is it? It's a huge church. Yeah, it's an after a problem. That's that's all on the west side. Yeah, but you know, the, this was the, first of all, the Italian community spread from the East River to the Hudson River, from 11th Street down to City Hall. That's how huge it was. So there was a lot. There was another Italian section, large Italian section in the village, where 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 Saint Anthony of Padua is, which is a beautiful church. So that's what I know about. It. Is that what you want to know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So you know, you mentioned this was the largest Italian ethnic community. Any idea how large the population was at High Point? It's hard to say because I don't I don't have the, I don't have the numbers for the for the entire area. I know that it was I know the numbers for the city, you know, in terms of the entire the entire city. But it was well it was well it was well over two thousand people, two million people, in in New York City, the five boroughs all together. That pain so well over two million. We still today, the um, you know, the seventeen percent of New York State, about eight percent of the city is of Italian descent. About eight percent, even today. Okay. Which is a large number. Going back to the difference on Mulberry and Maud and Elizabeth or whatever, how different were these communities? The the people from Calabria, did they have different types of shops? The Sicilians, the Neapolitans. Were there, was there was there a a Sicilian butcher, a Sicilian pastry shop, a Neapolitan? How can you give us a little detail on that? Well, absolutely, there was. You know, there, 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 you had all these specialty stores, and you would go to your you would go to your paisans. So even if there was even if there was a butcher on Mulberry Street and you were Sicilian, you were going to go to the one on on, on Elizabeth Street. I mean, you just look at that just the way it was. There is still is a butcher on 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 Elizabeth Street, you know, yeah. the old butcher just just south of Houston Street. He's still there. It's like one of the, you know, it's hard to even because they they're between all the shops, the new shops that have come in, but he's still there. Yes, yeah. there were these different stores. There were these different <coughs> specialized in different types of product that was indicative of a particular region. Absolutely, you know, that was that was, and you know. He, it was like going into a different different area when you walk from one place to another. I mean, the story that you know sometimes I sometimes I tell, but you know I, I used to I didn't understand this when I was a kid. My father my father and mother used to like have these you know as you know parents will talk to each other and have arguments about things, and you know they would get into like which which region was better than the other. Because <laughs> my father was just saying my mother was Calabrese and a little Napoli town, but they're mostly mostly Calabrese. So you know, they, you know, who's better? Which one's better? You know, but and, and to me, it made no sense. Because, you know, because we're, I figure we're, we're all. First of all, I thought we're all American. Right. That's you know, second, not second, American. second, second, secondly, you know, we're Italian American. You know, but, you know, but no, they didn't see it that way. There were distinctions. Very. And when when a girl from Elizabeth Street uh -huh. married a girl married a guy from 
Yeah. From Mott Street or from uh -huh. Mulberry Street, that's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a big deal. It's a mixed marriage. They moved to Levittown. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, my family came here. They went to Christie Street and Forsyth and Eldridge and but the population wasn't only Italian. No, no, it was mixed. It was Jews. It was yeah, a lot because my grandmother said she used to drink coffee in a glass. Yeah. My and she learned it from, she said, the Jewish women. But that's how they all drank. This area that we're in right now that we're sitting in, this was really solidly Italian. This was solid. But as you got to the fringes, my grandfather, when I, after my, my grandparents got married, they moved to Ludlow, right next to Katz's. Right next, and so my grandfather spoke Yiddish. You know, he, was, he was Jewish, but he spoke Yiddish. Why? The same reason why he had a bissel of tea, right? You know, the same it's because you, you know, these were your neighbors, and it wasn't the same type of conflict that you have today amongst ethnic groups. In unfortunately, I have to say, you know, they, they, it was more of a more of a camaraderie and helping each other. You know, it didn't, and you were all in the same boat at those days. It was a lot different. Yeah. I have to say, with all due respect, my grandfather grew up in New York, and he said that uh, it, from a Jewish background, his parents came here from Russia, and that the Italians and the Jews got along very, very well. The Italian, the Jews and the Irish, a little questionable sometimes. So I think there were more alliances between some groups and the Jews. The Jews and the Italians came, came about the same time. Yeah, that's and true. that's and so they they were going through the experience the same. Yeah. The Irish got here early. You know, and they had established themselves, so they felt they were one rung up on the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. A story I'll tell you, I didn't tell you before. <coughs> All St. Patrick's Cathedral. Have you been to it? Yes. Okay. All St. Patrick's Cathedral was the first cathedral in New York, before the one on Fifth Avenue. You knew this, right? Yes. Okay. The reason why the Church of Most Precious Blood was built was because the Irish clergy would not allow the Italian Catholics to receive matrimony on the main altar. Ooh. That's a fact. So in 1888, the Scalabrini fathers built Most Precious Blood. Now, of course, once you have parity, everything changes. So now, by 19, 1908, my grandparents were married in all St. Patrick's at the main altar. But that was the reason. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a, it, was, it was a different type of... Of, you know, you don't, if you've seen gangs in New York, and you know, it gives you a little feeling for it too, there was a different type of hostility um, from those who were here before. They were like, you know, wanted to maintain <coughs> their position, and you know, the Italians and the Jews were taking, you know, they were taking over some of their spots. And I think that's a lot. That had a lot to do with it. Plus, the, you know, the, the language you know, we spoke different languages. They spoke, they spoke some English, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't really English English, but they spoke some English. So there was, a, there was a lot more differences. Yes, sir? The, um, talking about Italians getting along with different ethnic groups, my, my family um, lived in East Harlem for a while. I remember my mother telling me how up to the Second World War, the Italian, young Italians from East Harlem would go into Central Harlem where all the well, it, was, it was all black, but all the swing clubs and the dance clubs were there. And there used to be a, a, lot, a lot of mixing at that time. And uh, up, there were some racial riots, I think, in the Second World War, and then that, that, that you know, stopped. But, but for quite a while, there was a, a lot of mixing of that group and, and those groups. And also, uh, if you look at some old uh, jazz records, you'll see, you know, Italian slang and Jewish slang and even black slang all sort of <coughs> mixed, mixed together. So, so up to you know for the first few decades from the immigration to the Second World War, there was a lot of mixing of, of these groups. At least according to what my family uh, said, and they moved a little, a few, a, a little of them. Some of them were down down um, in the village south of Washington Square Park. None, none over here on Mulberry Street. A lot of it in. in um, East Harlem and, and a lot on uh, Arthur Avenue, but uh, there, there was a lot of things. And later on, when when racial conflicts got worse and people moved to the suburbs and the group started splitting up, you see you know all this racial animosity that for a while really didn't exist because everybody was in the same boat. Everybody was poor, everybody was struggling, and and they got along for quite a while until uh, you know things started uh, pushing groups apart. 
Well, you know, I, I think it's an. Thank you for that. But I think it's an Ameri I think it's an American experience, and I and I have my own feelings about it. I think it has to do with colonialism. I think it has to do with the English experience in America, because you find you don't find the same type of ethnic and racial conflicts in South America that you find in the United States in English-speaking countries. So I think it, I think it has a, think about that. It has a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, it's true. As a matter of fact, if you want if. Louis Armstrong was probably the most famous jazz jazz musician that ever was, I guess. You know, uh, Louis Armstrong would, would credit Nick LaRocca with having the, the first J Dixieland jazz band. Um, yeah, there was a large immigration. This is not about New York. It's about New Orleans of, Ita of Italians in the South after after the after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation. Southern planters thought that the Sicilians would be a suitable people to farm the lands. <laughs> so the Sicilians were, were, were brought in. The Sicilians didn't last too long at that. They started doing their own businesses, and before you know it became very successful. But yeah, so there was a lot of intermingling. And who did the, and who did the Italians mingle with mostly? The Africans, free, <coughs> free Africans. Um, so they were only taught not to be with them. Fine. They weren't by a society that was racially prejudiced to begin with. You know, and that's unfortunate because I will say this, and I'm not ashamed of it, and some people will take umbrage with it. Italians are not of we're not Aryans, you know. We're not we're not white as white could be. We're not from when unless you came from the Piedmonte region and then you're in your in your Germanic, you came from southern Italy, from the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And everybody mixed in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. In 1492, the Moors came through, came through the south. All right, and a lot of a lot of Italians have Jewish blood that don't even know it. <laughs> all right, a lot, especially in Calabria, by the way, especially in Calabria, and also in Sicily. And also in Sicily, the Moors came. The Moors came through. The Moors weren't too light skinned, you know. So you know, if, if you do a little searching around. You know, it's, so it's we were really taught in America to be prejudiced. It didn't come, it didn't come to us naturally, and it's unfortunate because you know even when you look at some of the documentation of immigrants coming into New York, or the Italians coming into New York, they'll have next to their category the dark skin, the light skin. All right, so that stopped after a while, but in the beginning that's the, that's the, that's the way it was. And it was it was it's more of a political determination. That it is actually a genetic determination, and you know that's that's America. Now you can take umbrage with me with this if you want. You know, I have a problem. I don't have a problem with that. But the facts are the facts. You know, I mean, everybody's come through something other. I mean, it was the melting pot of the Mediterranean. Yes, sir. Um, I'm assuming that in the height of the immigration, 1880 to 1920. Uh, very few of the Italian immigrants actually spoke Italian, but they only spoke their dialect. That's that correct. Is that true? I mean, could you yep. find any Italian spoken here at all? We, well, in, Little Italy, in Little Italy, I'm sure there be. I'm sure there was there was some you know, somebody who was educated you know, that could speak that could speak Italian, could be Dante Italian, but uh, for the most part, you know, they they survived on their dialect. And that, that also meant that if you were living in the Italian streets versus the Sicilian streets. Uh, you really couldn't communicate with each other, or very some of them really couldn't understand each other, particularly the Sicilians. Sicilian, Sicilian is really a separate language. It's really not. It's really. It's really not. It's not really a, like a dialect. It's like a language. So when did they start speaking Italian? Well, the, the well, two things happened. Well, after, before World War II, you had, you know, I will say Mussolini did a lot to do that. You know, to, and also radio and television that made for the common language. Prior to that, when you just start hearing the common language, it became um, good education. And more education, people started having the common language. But Mussolini started. Yes, sir. To the extent that you're able, what kind of a Italian presence do you want to see the area have for the future? Well, that's that's a loaded question. <laughs> What kind of an Italian? This is always going to be Little Italy. Um, yeah, there are going to be a lot of other stores around here. I'd like to see the area. I'd like to see the area maintained. 
I don't ever expect to see those pork stores again, in the park, <laughs> although I'd love to. But you know, but I do. I would like to see the area maintained in its in its artistic and in its architectural splendor that it once what it once was. What I see happening is what's happened. What happened with they what I call northern Little Italy. What they call Nolita, all right? North north of I call northern because northern Little Italy is becoming all of Little Italy. It's coming down. It ain't, it ain't, it's not staying across Kenya. It's coming down. If you look around, if you look around, you see the mushrooms coming up, but I, the mushrooms are the buildings here and there. This is gonna become more and more gentrified. That's gonna happen. The property values are just too high. And, the people, and whoever owns the property is gonna wanna get the money for them, they're gonna sell it. <coughs> That's what's gonna happen. So I, I see gentrification, but with preservationists like yourselves, um, hopefully that will be done with some you know, some sense to it, and not just complete uh, chaos. Yes.